This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Whether you're selling a little or a lot, Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. From the launch your online shop stage, all the way to the we just hit a million orders stage. No matter what stage you're in, Shopify's there to help you grow. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash special offer, all lowercase. That's shopify.com slash special offer. A science story, huh? Is NYU a scientist? They, I it felt, felt, felt right. Right. I was so and I just happy. Thought, well, I had figured it out. Wow. It was that tall. golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true, personal stories about science. I am your host, Erin Barker, and this week, in honor of Breast Cancer Awareness Month, we're presenting stories about cancer. Uh, In case you haven't heard, cancer sucks. It isn't great. In fact, I would go so far as to say it's actually very bad. And we have two folks on the podcast today who are going to explain much more eloquently and hilariously why that is. Our first story is from Gail Thomas. It was recorded in April 2018 at Caveat in New York City. The theme that night was diagnosis. Um, So it's August 2009. It's a bright, sunny day in Brooklyn. And I have a doctor's appointment. Now, normally I would ride my bike, but I can barely walk, so I catch a cab. It's the week after my hysterectomy. Hysterectomy, right? I never thought I'd say that. My sex organs are gone. We didn't really get to say goodbye. I uh, didn't plan to have kids, but I thought, well, maybe, I don't know, if the ovaries balance something else out or not, I don't know. But I'm not worried, it's my post-op appointment, and this is when my young, good-looking doctor is gonna shake my hand and tell me, congratulations, we got all the cancer. I get to his office, he brings me in, he's wearing a uh, sort of these khaki slacks and a button-down shirt, and he looks more like a teacher's assistant than an oncology doctor. He motions for me to sit, he closes his office door, no handshake, and he goes and starts pacing back and forth behind his desk. He's not as cute as I remember. <laughs> I feel like that I just, I'm a graduate student that just failed an exam or something. And then he starts speaking. Mrs. Thomas, it's serious. The cancer has spread from your uterus to your ovaries. I'm not sure if we got it all. I don't want to give you false hope. False hope. I'll take false hope. I'll take any hope you got. Just bring on the hope. That's good. I don't say that. He continues. Mrs. Thomas, it's stage 3A, metastasis. You have a 50-50 chance of being alive in five years if you don't do exactly what I say. Mrs. Thomas? (laughs) I'm not married. My mom's not there. And this guy just took my uterus, my fallopian tubes, and my ovaries out of my vagina. I think we can be on a first name basis. (laughs) And he keeps talking. He starts talking about treatment. He says six weeks of radiation daily, followed by six months of chemotherapy. I, he says other things, more statistics, but all I hear is six weeks of radiation followed by six months of chemotherapy starting immediately. He calls it protocol, standard treatment. It sounds like a threat. I finally speak and I say, well, I'd like a second opinion. And he says, okay, as long as you start treatment first. I don't think that's how second opinions work. (laughs) I think you're supposed to get the opinions and then decide. Plus, research says that you should heal from surgery before you start treatment. Now, I don't have a medical degree, but I do have a law degree, and I'm not good at confrontation, but I'm really good at research. 
And research also says that what standard treatment one year can be, can be over treatment the next year. It also says that every patient is different. I have other reasons to be concerned about this surgeon. I have a fever that is so high that I'm not sleeping at night, and when I tell him this, he won't give me antibiotics. He says, oh, it's just menopause. I have so much drainage coming out of my body that I'm wearing adult-sized diapers, and I can't walk the dog half a block without dripping. And I don't tell him this. I woke up during surgery. I know. It's, but, and I heard just long enough to hear him say, she's not that bloated, she shouldn't look like that. I fell back. And he won't even talk about side effects. Doesn't he know that there's more to my life than just living? What about my bike? Can I ride my bike after chemo? And what about my other organs? How would the bladder feel about this? What about the heart? How does it affect the heart? I walk out of there in a daze, and I'm thinking about my friend D, who had gone through aggressive cancer treatment, and I don't know if I would want to live like that. I walk through his waiting room, and I notice that the chairs are dingy, and the tables are kind of, it looks like a garage sale. Is this young surgeon my only hope? Did I just choose him because he's good looking? I've made that mistake before. <laughs> I don't have time to cry. I get home, I have, I'm CEO of Gail's biggest decision ever, and I've got to make the right one. I hit Google. Dr. Google is equally scary. Side effects include nausea, fatigue, dizziness, more cancer, more nausea, uncontrollable flipping eye movements, that's from the nausea medication, and sex, apparently, and the doctor didn't tell me this, apparently radiation sort of tightens everything down there and not in a good way. You know, I may be older than my surgeon, but I'm not ready to give it up. I still got a boogie. I'm single, you know, but I'm scared. So I'm a frantic Googler by, by night, and I'm a good patient by day. So I agree to go to meet the radiation oncologist. He's got droopy eyebrows and a little gray in his beard, and he, he comes into the room, and he's holding my chart, and he looks at me, and he looks at my chart, and he looks at me, and he looks at my chart, as if he's trying just to decide between the two of us. And then he sits across from me, about, I don't know, about four feet across from me, but it feels like he's holding my hand. And he says, you know, there's a chance that you don't need any treatment. There's a chance that you actually have, your lymph nodes were completely clear, 26 clear nymph, lymph nodes. He said, there's a chance that what you have is two early stage primary cancers, one that was on the surface of the ovaries and one that's on the surface of the uterus, which means stage one and no treatment necessary. <laughs> two cancers is good news. <laughs> I guess that's why you need a medical degree. <laughs> But this is hope. This is real hope. I'm more confused, but I am now really officially hopeful. So I go home, and now research is exhilarating. I'm, it's a life or death matter. You know, I'm like super Google Gale, right? And I'm on, I'm up late 3 a.m. every night, and I get more opinions. I go to my yoga teacher. He says, get, eat a raw onion every day. <laughs> you won't have any friends, but you won't get cancer. My Dominican handyman stops by with an Alvira plant. And my brother is like Rambo. He's like, do it all, do it all, just do it all. He's an MBA, so he knows. <laughs> but I'm scared. What if the doctor is right? So I agree to radiation, but first I have to go to what they call a simulation appointment. I get there, and it's a large room once more with the same sort of garage sale furniture, only there's boxes, so it's also a storage closet. And they lay me down on this, you know, that uh, they've got those like silver tin uh, steel tables and I lay on that thing and the nurses put this mold around me because they have to get it to like the same size as my hips, right? So that the radiation goes into the same place 30 times. And then they pull out this little tattoo device and they go zit, zit, zit. It's like a triangular uh, 
uh, little tattoos around my pelvis to make sure that the radiation goes to the same place 30 times. It feels wrong. But I tell myself, well, this is the price of living. The morning of my first radiation appointment, it still feels wrong. So I call and I say, I'm not going to come in today. And I do more research. Now I'm going to get more pathology reports. I get four total, and the third out of the four one from a very prestigious hospital agrees with the last doctor. It says two early stage cancers, no treatment necessary. The lymph nodes were clear. It didn't spread. I'm so happy. This is the one I'm picking. I'm going to go with this one. And so I, I call my, my surgeon, my young surgeon, and I tell him the good news. And he won't listen. He says six months of chemotherapy followed. Now he switched the order now, followed by six weeks of radiation starting immediately. And then he goes on vacation, and I meet more doctors, and then I break up with him. (laughs) Thank you. I send an email because I don't like confrontation. (laughs) But I get out of there. And by now, I have found Dr. C. Dr. C is a tall, thin, he has very, very sort of, almost shaved, but very, very, just a light bit of gray hair. And he has kind eyes, and he makes eye contact, and he calls me Gayo. And he nods, and he has this little twinkle in his eye when he speaks, and he listens to me talk about my fears and my concerns. And he tells me, it's your decision. You have time. It's up to you. And he doesn't laugh when I say, what's the least amount of treatment I can do without seeming suicidal? And then he talks to the radiation board at the hospital on my behalf. They talk about me. They talk about my individual case. Not a statistic. Not everyone. Just me. And then they decide that I don't need to do radiation. And then he tells me that he's heard of a study in Italy where you only need three rounds of chemotherapy. Three months. Half of what the original bully surgeon wanted me to do. We compromise. I did to do any radiation. I did some chemotherapy. That was 10 years ago. I'm cancer free. I didn't have any nausea, no side effects. And I don't even think about it much anymore. Except when I'm getting dressed and I see those little tattoos, because they're permanent, those little tattoos. But when I do, I don't think about that garage sale treatment room or my condescending surgeon. I remember that I actually stood up for myself. And that I found allies that I could trust in a partnership. So I see Dr. C now every year just to sort of say hi. That's it. Um, One of my recent visits, I actually told him that I was starting to share this story. And as he was leaving, he turned to me and he said, I don't usually tell my patients this, but I'm a cancer survivor too. And if I hadn't gotten a second opinion, I wouldn't be alive today. I guess he learned to stand up for himself too. Thank you. That was Gail Thomas. Gail has been a writer, actor, teacher, filmmaker, and lawyer. She is a Moth Story Slam winner and has performed at shows around New York City, including Risk, Sideshow Goshko, and The Liar Show. She teaches storytelling for the Story Studio in, here in New York, and I would personally recommend her as a teacher if you're in the area and looking to learn. Her voiceover credits include David Letterman, Beavis and Butthead, and Angelo Rules. Her short comedy, My BFF, was rated 95% funny on Funny or Die and was an audience favorite at New Filmmakers. As a speechwriter for the Tribeca Film Festival and the Gotham Awards, her words were uttered by Oscar winners and other fancy people with great clothes. 
A few weeks ago, one of our producers, Paula Croxon, and I produced a Story Collider Presents partner show with a company called Insight, featuring stories from patients with blood cancer. And it was so impactful for our audience, but also for me and Paula personally. And something I didn't know until one of our storytellers told me is that you can actually sign up for the bone marrow registry in like five seconds at be the match.org. And if they find you a match, these days the donation procedure is most of the time just like giving blood. It's that easy. And just from that, you could literally save someone's life. How crazy is that? So I was all out of excuses not to sign up after that. And I did. And they sent me a kit in the mail with these little swabs that you rub on the inside of your cheek and you mail back so they can match you with someone. It all felt very important, very sciencey. So I highly recommend the experience so far. Our next story today is from Pierce McManus. It was recorded in April 2018 at Beer Baron in Washington, D.C. The theme that night was expectations. When I was a child, my parents bestowed upon me a rather unfortunate nickname. They called me Boo Boo Boy. I'll say it one more time, Boo Boo Boy. Because every nick, cut, scratch, cold, illness, malady, real or imagined, would send me into complete hysterics, quickly followed with a desperate search for some sort of parental consolation. My father was a grizzled New York City police officer. My mother was an old school, devout Catholic. Basically what I'm trying to say is, Parental consolation in any form was in very short supply in the McManus household. Here comes Boo Boo Boy, my father would say, whenever he saw me approach with tears in my eyes. Now, in retrospect, I know that nickname, Boo Boo Boy, was a thinly veiled attempt on the part of my parents to toughen me up. And quite frankly, I don't blame them. I was a pudgy, bookish lad with more imaginary friends than real friends, a propensity to burst into tears at the drop of a hat, and all the athletic skill of a wet sponge. (laughs) I loathed being called Boo Boo Boy, and I made it my goal over the years to put as much time and space as I possibly could between him and me. And by the time I hit my 40s, I was pretty sure I had completely shaken the stigma of Boo Boo Boy. I was living in Washington, D.C. I had a successful career in advertising. I had the swinging Mad Men bachelor lifestyle that accompanied a career in advertising. And I had finally discovered a sport that I was actually good at, distance running marathons. I went from being a kid who would cry at the first sign of pain to pursuing a hobby that required a high pain threshold. Yeah, take that, mom and dad. (laughs) And when I say I was into running, I mean, I was really into running. And I was really good at it, too, like Boston Marathon good. And in the fall of 2010 at the Philadelphia Marathon, I qualified for my sixth Boston Marathon. Life was good. The world was my oyster. I had a a great job. I loved my swinging bachelor ways. And I loved the counterbalance and the mental discipline that running offered. I would say I felt invincible. And if we've learned anything from the Old Testament, Shakespearean tragedies, and mid-1990s Nicolas Cage films. (laughs) It's that the minute you begin to feel invincible is the exact moment you should begin to watch your back for the unfathomable comeuppance that is waiting for you right around the corner. I ran smack dab into my comeuppance four months after that marathon. When I woke up one morning, made my way to the bathroom, hopped in the shower, and proceeded to cough up blood everywhere. I do mean everywhere. My bathroom looked like the murder scene from Psycho. 
So naturally, anyone in their right mind would exit the shower, dry off, and call a medical professional. I did not. I was ridiculously hungover. I had spent the previous night at the annual advertising bacchanalia known as the Addy Awards, and I had raised all sorts of cane into the early morning hours. And truthfully, as I surveyed the crime scene that was my bathroom, I could hear the voice of my mother. See all that? God is punishing you for your poor choices. (laughs) So I told no one. Six months would pass before I found myself in a doctor's office. I had gone downtown for my annual physical. Everything looks good, my doctor told me, but is there anything else you need to tell me? The truth was, my life had begun a complete tailspin since that first coughing up blood episode. I was tired, I was lonely, but most of all, I was scared. I couldn't keep it a secret anymore. I've been coughing up blood, I told her. Things really took off from there. A week later, I made my way downtown for a CT scan to identify the source of all that blood. We're going to inject you with some dye, a nurse told me. That helps us read the scan better, but there's only one small side effect. It makes you feel like you're wetting your pants. (laughs) And as I lay in this giant metal tube for what seemed like forever. I was just completely terrorized, not at the notion of what the doctors might find, but out of fear that I had actually wet my pants. (laughs) And when the scan was complete, I was very relieved to discover that that was not the case. But what I did discover shortly thereafter was six missed phone calls from my doctor and one very urgent voicemail. Pierce, you need to call me right away. It's never a good sign, guys. The scan had revealed a large mass in my right lung. I've made you an appointment with a pulmonologist this afternoon, my doctor informed me. Three hours later, I found myself in another examination room in downtown DC. The doors swung open, a doctor entered, and without introducing himself, he raised his finger to his chin, he looked me up and down and said, hmm, you don't strike me as the cancer type. (laughs) Two weeks later, I am diagnosed with cancer. Lyomyosarcoma, it's a soft muscle tissue cancer with a 50% life expectancy, depending on which medical journal you read. But here's the thing, it's typically found in the uterine lining of older women, not in the lungs of healthy marathon runners. You're one in a million, my doctor tells me and I smile at the notion of winning cancer Powerball. (laughs) I make the long walk home to my house that morning and I am in complete shock at the news. And as much as it pains me, as as much as I don't want to return to my boo-boo boy ways, I call my parents. It goes right to voicemail. (laughs) I make my way finally into the lobby of my condo building and just Out of sheer habit, I check my mail. I reach into the mailbox, and I pull out a large postcard. Congratulations. You're accepted to the 2012 Boston Marathon. The race is six months away. I wonder if I'm even going to be alive in six months' time. My my grandfather went from cancer diagnosis to deathbed in in the span of three months. And then, in that moment, I am overcome with something I am not accustomed to. Sheer, unmitigated anger. Fuck that. I am running this race. I am going to be in Boston for the 2012 Boston Marathon. I'm not going to let cancer, and I'm not going to let anything 
stop me. I just needed to get my doctors on board with this plan. <laughs> Things did not get off to a good start when I met my surgeon. You will, lose, you will lose part of your lung, that is for certain. There is a good chance you will lose all of your lung. Things only went downhill from there when I, when I met my oncologist. He described a series of radiation treatments that would happen after the surgery. But I've got the Boston Marathon, I told him. Oh, Pierce, there be other marathons. You need to focus 2012 on getting cancer free. Clearly, this plan was not working. I needed a plan B. And plan B meant a second opinion. So I gathered all my materials and slides and I sent them off to Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City. Due to the unique nature of my diagnosis, they completely expedited my case. And in a week's time, I was sitting right across from one of Sloan Kettering's top thoracic surgeons. I hear you run marathons, he said. My daughter runs marathons too. I knew immediately that I was in great hands. A year to the day of my marathon, uh, Boston Marathon qualifying run in Philadelphia, I had surgery at Sloan Kettering. The doctor described it to me as having a lung transplant with my own lung. And the challenge was being able to remove the tumor without having to remove any of the, uh, any parts of my lung. I woke hours later and was miraculously informed that both my lungs were still intact. That's where things got really weird. Because <laughs> further analysis of the tumor would indicate that I had been completely misdiagnosed. I did not have Lyomire sarcoma. I had the equally rare and kind of bizarre glomus tumor, which is a benign tumor typically found underneath fingernails. <laughs> Don't worry, Pierce, my doctor told me. You're still one in a million. <laughs> I was in the hospital for four, four days, and I was released on Thanksgiving Day 2011. And I wound up r spending the next two months recuperating under the watchful eye of my mom and dad in, in my childhood home. We were worried about you, boo-boo boy, my parents told me. <laughs> we're, we're, we're happy to have you home. A few weeks later, I had a follow-up appointment with uh, my surgeon. And I said, you know, Doc, you got the marathon coming up. When can I start running? He says, running? We can operate on your legs. You can start running whenever you want. <laughs> <laughs> so I started running. In four months' time, I made my way to the start of the Boston Marathon. And uh, I savored every minute of that race. And I still savor every minute. That was Pierce McManus. Pierce relocated to Washington from New York in 1992 to pursue a career in international diplomacy. Since then, he's been running marathons, fronting a sleazy rock band with an unprintable name, and producing award-winning digital campaigns for Fortune 500 clients. He's a fixture of DC's decorated storytelling scene and co-host of the underground smash hit show, Perfect Liars Club, which actually one of our DC producers, Miriam Zeringholm, just got an opportunity to tell a story in a couple weeks ago. So awesome. Highly recommend that show. The Story Collider is grateful for the support of the Tiffany & Co. Foundation and of Science Sandbox, a Simons Foundation initiative dedicated to engaging everyone with the process of science. Story Collider is directed by Liz Neely and Aaron Barker. That's me. With help from our amazing, amazing team. 
The stories featured in today's podcast were from shows produced by Tracy Rowland, Paula Croxon, Miriam Zaringhollum, and Shane Hanlon. The podcast is produced by Zoe Saunders. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to Caveat and Beer Baron for hosting these shows, and to everyone out there, scientist and non-scientist alike, working to help cure, treat, prevent, and otherwise fight cancer. Thanks for listening. Thank you.